this webinar. This meeting is being recorded. There you go, so that um, you're able to access all of this later on as well. Um, I'll send a follow-up email for all of you um, next week once this is all online so that you have those links and all the necessary contacts to get questions to. Um, so as you have questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to leave those in the chat. We'll be monitoring that throughout this webinar um, and asking those at the end. Um, we do ask that you remain on mute throughout the course of the webinar just to kind of keep background noise to a minimum so that everyone can hear what's going on. And I think that should be it from me. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lori and let her introduce herself and the topic a little bit more. Great. Thank you, McKenna. And thank you for hosting. Teresa and I were really excited to be able to share this important information. Um, about accessibility and the new law. Um, we know you have lots of questions. We have been receiving quite a few already. So we're gonna try to cover um, as much as we can within the first half of the um, webinar. And then we'll leave, try to leave the second half open for Q&A. Um, so I will keep an eye um, on that clock. I'm gonna... So uh, again, I'm Lori Kubitz. I am a um, OIT solution architect um, for accessibility. That means that I work with all of the agencies to help them understand accessibility compliance and to help them um, with their accessibility plans um, to align with the new bill HB 211110. And I'm joined by my partner, Teresa Montano. Teresa, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yep. yep. Okay, great. I had a little bit of trouble getting on, so I'm just checking. I'm Teresa Montano. I'm the um, accessibility architect for the state of Colorado. And I'm happy to be here. Um, my background is a software engineer um, and, and project manager master that sort of thing for 25 years now <laughs> and I've been with the state for four years so we're excited to be here today thanks Teresa so um, we're gonna first go over HB 211110 give you a summary what the impact is um, and some of those important terms that you're gonna need to know and then I'll go over um, recommendations for putting together a plan. Um, I have uh, a template that you all will be able to access and copy and then customize it any way you want that fits your organization. Um, and then I'll, I'll also share some other resources that we have for you all along the way. Then, like I said, there'll be a, a quick cue or not quick, we hope that there's plenty of time for Q&A. So Teresa, do you want to give the summary of sure. the Sure. Right. Okay. So HB 211110 was signed by the governor on June 30th last year. And um, it's very exciting. We've had laws on the books for decades and nobody's really paid attention at the state level and kind of dug ourselves into this hole now because there's a lot of different states that have, are getting a lot of different lawsuits regarding accessibility. Um, we get reports on this every month to show us what's going on in the rest of the United States. And um, for just for example, uh, the state of California purchased a, it was for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, they purchased a $66 million piece of software for like for uh, reserving campsites and fishing licenses and that sort of thing, and it's not accessible. So if you even if you even Google it, sixty-six million dollar California lawsuit, you'll see what I'm talking about. But so that's that's just one thing that's out there. That's kind of the sort of thing that we're we are reviewing. We do not want to be in that place. So this law will be effective um, on on the uh, 2024. Um, and in the meantime, thank goodness we have the opportunities to remediate our websites, our, our applications, and our kiosks. So um, what we're doing at the state and what 
what we are recommending is that everybody take inventory of what you have and then do some evaluation and have some, uh, get some manual testing or use the automated testing to see what needs to be remediated. And at the end of the day, what really needs to happen by 2024 is that we've done our due diligence. We've looked at all of our websites and all of our applications and our kiosks and everything. And we have um, at least we've, we've remediated what we can and that we are available. This is the big thing, I think. Um, at the beginning, we, we were thinking, well, someone who, um, who, who's blind or using assistive technology um, needs some support. They can't get into the website to get their um, benefits or whatever they're looking for. Okay, so they need to have someone immediately to contact so that they can get their benefits. And the main thing is that we get them through the process, even if the website, for whatever reason, they can't use it. We get them the benefits they need, and then we work through the technical issues with them. But as long as we're showing that we're working with these with our residents, that we're we're trying to get them the benefits, um, we we believe that that is is the most important thing. Because then, if the person is happy with the service. That's, that's the main thing. They get their benefits and they're happy with the service. Um, if they're not, they can go ahead then and file their civil lawsuit. And that's not anything that we're involved with. That's something they'll do on their own. So at the beginning, we thought that perhaps they could go in, they couldn't do it, they couldn't get through the website, um, they found this error, that error, and they would immediately get $3,500 that's not the case. So it's it's more that we get them through, we get them their benefits, we make sure they're happy, and we've done our due diligence. So that's the basic the basics of this new law. And um, Lori will talk more about some of the what's in between there. Right. Thanks, Teresa. So. Um... Just in summary, um, the legislation places responsibility for compliance on plat platform providers and content owners. So it's good to think about accessibility, accountability from those two lenses. Content like the text, videos, images, audio, PDFs that you're creating and putting out on the web. And then the platform, for example, Colorado.gov or um, uh, an, uh, Salesforce platform or you know an application platform. That's like the back end. Um, the, you could think of it as like the code. Um, so throughout um, what I'm going to share with you, try to keep keep those two separate pieces in mind, um, and we will clarify how to approach both of those. Um, so OIT, just to clarify the role of OIT, we have, we are statutorily required to establish the statewide accessibility standards. And at the end of this presentation, which um, McKenna will share with you all later, um, there are resources that point to our standards. And those are, for those of you who are familiar with them, WCAG, the most recent published version, and that is 2.1 and we're going with level A and AA. So again, those resources will be at the end. Um, the most important date here to keep in mind is that all state agencies and local governments must be compliant with the standards by July 1st of 2024. And like Teresa was saying, um, it's very important to recognize that 100% compliance is not going to be possible. One, because accessibility is a moving target. Because our technology is always changing, we're always adding new content. We have new people coming on board who need training and accessibility. So what's really important is that we have um, the systems and processes in place that can support equitable services. Like to Teresa's point, having a point of contact um, and being able to um, offer accommodations that are equal to 
how um, a non-disabled person would access your services. And I'll go through that with the plan as well. Um, and I think I had a second point and now I don't remember what it is, um, but we will get to it, I promise. Some important terms that um, I want to mention, local government, I've had this question quite a few times, is defined by the Colorado Revised Statute definitions as um, government of any county, city, and county, home rule, or statutory city, town, special district, or school district. Um, and then platform, platform provider, um, that includes, for example, OIT and SIPA, um, and then all, vendors, depending on you know, who actually created that platform, right? For agencies, many, uh, for many state agencies, it's OIT. I, um, and for many local governments who use state agency built tools, it will be OIT. For example, the, again, the Colorado.gov, the um, platform provider is SIPA or NIC, formerly known as CI. Um, and then also you contract with other vendors outside who may be providing website or application or kiosk platforms. Um, again, a website uh, or an application platform is what it is built on. And then the other part is content owners. So just to be very clear, um, content owners are the individuals and teams that create, publish, and maintain online content, um, like all of those uh, media that I had mentioned earlier, including embedded third-party applications too. And then the Web Content Accessibility Guide, those are the international web standards that OIT standards are based on. And there's a link to that here um, that you'll be able to follow. So before I jump into the planning template, I, I recognize that it can feel very overwhelming. It is an enormous undertaking. It's huge, especially for the smaller teams with very little to no resources at all. So um, the, the re something to keep in mind though, that I think most people already understand and it really helps to motivate us or at least keep us from <laughs> burying our heads in the sand or being discouraged is that um, this is about um, equal access and the advocates, disability advocates and many of our legislators have been working for this for so long. And the disability community is very frustrated with, um, with state governments, um, for waiting for state governments to voluntarily update their services. So this bill really kind of empowers everyone to act now. Um, it's finally time to take care of it and um, to give Coloradans all an equal opportunity um, to access state government services, to um, get employment through state government, um, state and local government, and also to engage in the democratic process as well. So I just wanted to say that this, this whole presentation is not just about compliance with the law, but remembering why we're doing this is really integral to a successful accessibility program and sharing that throughout our teams and that messaging. So um, I'm gonna share with you here in the chat, um, the template. This is a Google template that I gave access. I gave um, anybody on the internet has access to this. It's just view, view only. Feel free to uh, make a copy, export it into um, Excel, whatever you need to do. This is really not intended to be a strict, you have to do this. Um, within the law, state government, like the executive branches, they are required to provide this plan to OIT, um, to our Technical Accessibility Program Office by July 1st of 2022. That is not true for local government. You are really on your own. I mean, I, I don't mean that we, we are here to support you. There's lots of support. Um, 
throughout your own, you know, organizations and um, allies, but um, you are not required to submit a plan. So there has been a few questions about that that I've gotten um, through the OIT um, help, help desk. So just to be very clear, the only date you all need to be most concerned about is July 1st of 2024, and that is the compliance date. So um, this document is designed to be a source of truth and a documentation hub. So I encourage you to use it to link to all of your other documentation um, to show that you are doing your due diligence. Again, we realize that 100% compliance is not gonna be possible by July 1st of 2024, probably, likely, um, but show, being able to prove that you are making the steps and that you're putting in place what you can, what you do have re resources for, and that you're planning for resources to operationalize accessibility is gonna be key to um, being able to comply and probably not get sued. Although I should have said from the beginning, Teresa and I are not lawyers, we're not offering legal advice. We can't guarantee you're not going to get sued, but we do believe that if you follow these steps um, and you can show that you are working earnestly towards compliance, that it will help you tremendously. Um, so this template is gonna help you in two ways. One, it's gonna help you to um, begin to remediate and um, your accessibility issues. So we refer to it as digging ourselves out of the hole. Um, we also refer to it as accessibility debt. So all of those documents that we've put out or websites and we're like, I'm on this deadline, I don't have time, I don't know how to do accessibility, I'll do it later, I'll take that course later. You're creating more and more and more accessibility debt and now it's time to pay up. So that's, that's gonna, this plan is gonna help you address that. And then the second part is to operationalize accessibility. So it's gonna help you create governance, like actually, you know, whether it's a racy chart or you have one person who is accountable um, on your team or in your organization. Um, and then you'll be able to av avoid that in the future, not just governance, also processes and skills and, and I'll walk you through all that. Also in this presentation, there's a link to the template as well. So this presentation along with the template, those will work together. So I didn't, I, I put lots of words in the presentation, so you'll be able to refer to it later on, but I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly here because we have like, I'm try, gonna try to wrap it up in 10 minutes. So these are the, um, the six core um, criteria for operationalizing and for remediating your accessibility. Um, and actually what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna pull it up here and just kind of go over quickly. There's an about page. It is, this document is structured as in like a maturity matrix. So you can, if you wanted to apply this to many teams in your organization, someone could use it to monitor progress and the maturity level and to actually see where the gaps are and where they need support if that's how you want to apply it. Um, so that's what these three colored levels are, launch, integrate, and optimize. Um, and then you can see along the bottom, we have all these tabs. Six of them are for the core criteria. So the governance, roles, and responsibilities section um, really, again, speaks to that. Let's, let's put a RACI in place. Who's responsible? Who's accountable? Um, who is consulted and who's informed. Um, this is beginning to operationalize. Um, within that plan, there is a column, I believe it's column D. Oh, now I'm gonna have to check. Yes. Um, 
Nope, it's column C, sorry. In column C, on all of these six tabs, there's an opportunity for you to add a point person. That's to get us to start thinking about and identifying who's responsible for these um, different pieces and parts. Um, let's go back into viewer mode. Um, so I have a link to OIT's accessibility guide um, that will help you to communicate the responsibilities of these parties. So we, we have, we really, um, after doing lots of interviews and testing and um, working with our state agencies who are just like a variety of people and roles and skill levels, we've learned that accessibility can be such a complicated technical um, topic that has a lot of jargon and not everybody needs to know everything about accessibility, right? Not everybody needs to know what the WCAG 2.1 level A and level AA criteria are. But most people do need to know how to create an accessible document or how to ensure that your meeting is accessible. So um, on those, that, those web pages that I've linked to here, they go through the roles, um, common roles, and they explicitly lay out what the responsibilities are some um, how to approach accessibility within this role and links to resources for learning more. And then here on this slide, I just wanted to really be clear, what does that mean? What kind of roles are we thinking of? So we know it's communication teams, which I think a lot of you are in that role. Um, finance, 100% procurement, contracting and vendor management, we need to be um, collaborating with our vendors um, to ensure that the, every product that we purchase is accessible from the beginning before we buy it. It's essential um, that we understand whether their product is accessible or not. And if we've already contracted with them, then we need to do the hard work of working with them to, to for them to um, make their product accessible. It's not easy, but um, we hope to offer you as much, as much resources as we can. HR, that includes hiring um, and professional development. And I have links for some of that as well. Then product owners and applications teams, like if you have these kind of developers within your organizations. And, and then absolutely the executive leadership as well. So that cultural piece um, and management too, because management um, have, have the ability to create expectations for employees um, to, to add to their performance plans, for example, training modules that they're required to take. And like I mentioned, most people so that they can create documents, PDFs and presentations. So, um, and then the next section that, that um, might be the most immediate concern to most of you is the evaluation and remediation part. So um, like Teresa said, um, first we're going to want to inventory all of our digital touch points. So I've added a tab to that template for inventorying your um, websites and applications. Um, I've also, added a couple columns because I, I think it would be, well, in my experience and throughout our state agencies, it's been very helpful because the money conversation is usually the first one that comes up when you're speaking with leadership about the need to implement this. So um, we had, we based the cost on a project that um, the Colorado Division of Labor and Employment did for their unemployment insurance website which is a very large, or I'm sorry, application, which is a very large application. They hired a, 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 an evaluation and remediation company just to evaluate the application. And it took 80 hours. And 80 hours at $160 an hour, which is what the vendor charged close. And then um, OIT has a testing team and they also charge $160 an hour. 
That's where we got this estimate from. Um, then you'll be able to kind of get an idea of if you were to hire someone, this is what it would cost. So you can begin to plan for these kind of resources. And I know it's very overwhelming to see these kind of numbers, but I hope that it's helpful for you all in your communication efforts and also in your planning efforts. Um, okay, so I wanna clarify um, what you need to evaluate and remediate. Um, so it's all internal and ex the law applies to all internal and external um, websites, applications and kiosks, right? So we're not only improving access for um, our constituents to our services, but we're also removing roadblocks for our colleagues. So they have equal opportunity to their career paths. Um, and then um, again, it is according to the law, the government entity is accountable for the accessibility of the platform and the content. So for example, um, let's say my team has hired someone to create this platform and we're adding content to it, right? A website, it's my, I am accountable I'm responsible for holding the vendor accountable. I'm also responsible for holding my content contributors accountable. And overall, I'm accountable to Coloradans. They could sue me. So I would have to pay um, at the end of the day. Um, I do want to mention about Colorado.gov for those of you who are using the SIPA platform. Um, oh, this is an exception where OIT is actually working with SIPA and NIC to ensure that the platform is accessible. So although, of course, you're welcome to reach out to NIC and SIPA um, and collaborate with them, you, I hope that you can rest assured that um, that's one platform that we will be advocating for you um, because it's one platform for the whole state. Um, I know there will probably be lots of questions about that. So I think you kind of get a general idea. We have a section for skills. We have some resources here. Um, we have a section for communication and support. It is essential that you have a um, accessibility, the state accessibility, um, well, you need an accessibility statement and it needs to show that you're following the state standards um, and that you have a contact person. Again, this goes back to, there needs to be a process in place so that people can contact someone right away and get their service just as fast as someone who's not disabled. Um, and then there's some examples, I listed some examples of some really um, overachieving accessibility statements. These are really good. So. If it's just a footer and a contact, that's absolutely fine. You can look to OIT's website for that. Um, procurement and vendor management, we understand that is a challenge, like I said. I've listed um, some resources here. There's a checklist for, for vendors. So make sure that they, um, to make sure that they have this built into their culture and their tools. And then uh, also, list of questions for when you're evaluating RFPs. And then there's this software development lifecycle um, recommendation for teams who um, are, are actually working on like the, you know, the back end of any of any IT project um, or program. And there's again, more resources. So here at the end, there's a link to the planning template there's a link to our accessibility guides, an FAQ, the Colorado Accessibility Newsletter sign up. We just launched it Wednesday. Um, if you haven't already signed up, I think it's it's very helpful. Um, and then our, our WCAG reference guide. And then, and that is it. So I would love to open it up for q and I'm guessing there's lots of questions. 
All right, Bruni says, I may have missed this in the beginning. I understand you're sending out the recording, but will you be sending out the actual presentation? Absolutely, yeah. I believe McKenna um, CML will be sending the presentation out and the links. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you'll get a follow up with those links um, for the presentation and the recording. They'll all be housed in the same place so you can reference that on as many occasions as you would like. And then Leslie at the city of Boulder has asked, are you gonna do any training on how to test? Also recommended tools and costs would be great. Yes, it would be great. Um, we are not offering any training at this time, but um, our technical accessibility office, program office is brand new. I mean, we're two months old. So we are pulling, we're currently pulling together um, a training strategy that first will approach, uh, that first will address our state government, you know, the executive branch training needs, and then whatever we have that is free and open to local governments will absolutely include, include you all in that for sure. Um, and then the recommended tools and costs we do have on um, our accessibility guide pages. Um, wait, sorry, pull it up here. On our guide pages, um, for example, product owners and project managers, there's responsibilities and then what you can do. And there's a whole section on how to evaluate websites and applications for accessibility. And it lists out some free tools, but we currently, we don't have a list of vendors for you to, you know, and costs to choose from. Um, and okay, where am I? I'm at Olga. Will you be providing help with getting grants for ADA efforts? Um, we do not have plans for that currently, but I would refer to SIPA regarding grants and applying for grants. Um, how often do you recommend testing websites and platforms? That is a fantastic question, Lucia. Um, I would, you know, like I said, because technology is changing so quickly, I would highly recommend um, at least, you know, to have some automated testing that you could do regularly, like, um, well, the state of Colorado uses Site Improve. So that's an evaluation tool where um, you can add your websites and it will scan it every five days. So we're able to monitor the automated testing results, you know, based on our, our team's needs, um, which could be daily or weekly. Um, and then those free tools kind of work like that too. They're not as efficient. Um, but you also need to implement manual testing because automated testing will only find 30% of errors. Um, you really need someone who knows how to use a screen reader to do the testing. So Lucia, I would love to have a number for you. I haven't actually had the chance to consider how often it needs to happen because we know everyone has to do it right now, but if I had to throw something out there, I might say every year to two years, it should be manually tested. Yearly, I think. Teresa, would you? Yeah, and uh, you know, and if you know you're putting in new content, um, definitely make sure that you're, you know, testing it after you're putting in new content. Um, the other thing to remember is if you are creating something brand new. Start from the beginning. Um, if you can find somebody who who knows accessibility, it's best to start from step one. That knows you know how to plug in the headers correctly and the alt tags and how to make it accessible from from the beginning of the building it. That way, there this is included from the get go and not just at the evaluation end of the process. Yeah, good point. The operationalizing it is huge. 
Um, KMN asked, could you clarify who is eligible to be sued? I want to make sure I was understanding correctly how the content creators are eligible versus the government entity. It's the government entity. Um, so the government entity is accountable, and I'm sorry if that got confusing. The content creators are responsible, right? So it all comes down to that government entity needs to make sure that their content creators and their platform providers are providing compliant, you know, content and technology. Um, you mentioned local government aren't required to submit a plan this July. This is Debbie. We just have to be compliant in 2024. Is OIT able to look at a plan we put together to provide input or guidance? Um, I would love to say yes to that, Debbie. I really would, but um, I, I think the only thing that keeps Teresa and I sane is that we're to keeping our scope within what's statutorily required um, because we are serving 17, now 18 agencies um, and OIT and the governor's office. So um, just putting these plans together and, and trying to coordinate cross agencies than a handful. So uh, I'm sorry that we can't, um, but I would advise looking into consultants and also collaborating with the local government community. Like um, I'm just throwing this out there to Megan and Katie um, and Heather, um, you know, how can we leverage the work that's already being done in local governments um, and, you know, the, the successful accessibility programs that are already out there to learn from each other. And that's actually what we're relying on for um, our agencies as well. Our, we won't be successful if we're doing this in a bubble. Um, it, it, like I said, it's complicated. It's not everybody's wheelhouse and we have so much to learn from each other um, that it would really be a, a shame to not leverage what's out there currently. Um, and then Deb, does the planning template provide guidance on accessible in-person meetings and meeting notices? So um, yes, um, tangentially, like the communications and support process does address that. Again, it, it will be up to your agency to determine, you know, um, what you will address in the plan, but that's a great point and I highly recommend that you add that for sure. Um, Kim says, this is really helpful, thank you, you're welcome. I think it is also important to remember why all of this is so important, the human element. It also helps to make this process more palatable when you think about the fact that you are helping people who deserve the same access and that many people that many people take for granted every day. 100% hallelujah, Kim. Yeah. Thank you. Teresa, did and, you want to add? Oh, oh, just to keep in mind that, that my favorite words, universal code and design. So universal is, um, you know, that everyone can access this and that we're not just designing these for sighted people or people without disabilities. And we need to just keep that in mind. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we're making actually it, it is there is data to support strong data to support that when we improve services for people with disabilities, we're improving services for everyone. And when we identify solutions for people with disabilities, we actually are creating innovative solutions that we would never have thought of or implemented as quickly. You know, texting, um, there's just, there's so many wonderful things that have come from accessibility solutions that everyone can benefit from. And Ron says, ideas of where the new law applies beyond websites. What about HTML-based newsletters created using vendors such as MailChimp? Yep, that absolutely um, applies for sure. Um, I'm trying to think of where I added that documentation, but I think within the communications plan, like 
that's where I would look towards um, the, the comms teams. Oh, maybe that's where I had it. The communications teams, websites, newsletters, branded templates. So it, it's really great to get these teams, these specific teams together and just start brainstorming and also sharing with other, like I said, like other organizations. And if you have um, some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like organizations for your, you know, career, or your profession, professional organizations, like a meetup or something where you can collaborate and say, you know, what else is, you know, how are you all applying accessibility? So it really is, um, we want to provide the same information to people with disabilities as people with non-disabilities would get, right? Or the same opportunities for our colleagues. So it's really up to us to be thinking of what are the touch points? I like to use that phrase, what are all of the touch points? And my background is in user experience. So thinking about your service at, as a user journey. And from the very beginning to the very end, what are all of the touch points that someone has to go through? You know, the website, the registration, the training, um, the bill pay, the, the newsletter that they get, um, the events that they attend, the meetings, the meeting minutes, like, especially in government, it can be a lot, you know, um, not especially. I, I just think that thinking of it from that user journey and all of the digital touch points will help you to identify those. And Lucia says, thank you. And thank you. You're welcome. Um, Eric says, I heard your disclaimer that you are not attorneys, but has there been discussion at the state level that HB 211110 is an unfun unfunded mandate and therefore unenforceable? Oh yeah, unfunded mandate. That's like our favorite phrase in state government. <laughs> and it's usually accompanied by tears and of frustration. Um, so it's that double-edged sword, right? Like we're not gonna make change in government unless it's mandated, but we're not gonna be able to um, implement it unless it's funded. So we are currently working Actually, Teresa, do you want to talk about our, the funding work that's happening? Yeah, well, at a state, the state level, we're working on some funding, um, and it's, it's in the long bill. And, you know, for us, it's going to give us more of a staff to help um, the, the agencies and to be unconsult working with them um, on a con consultation basis and help through the evaluations. and. We're going to buy software to help with the evaluations. I think, um, you know, it, this has just been passed by by so many government entities for, like I started, like I started at the beginning of this for decades, and now the uh, disability advocates in the community is angry, really frustrated, and so this bill is here to help dig out of the hole. So whenever we're starting new projects now, we need to think about accessibility so we don't dig the hole deeper. Um, so, so you know, un unfortunately, yes, it is unfunded, and um, especially for the municipalities. But we're we're doing what we can right now. It's just me and Lori, and we've got. I'm telling you, we've got 17 agencies. We're so overwhelmed. So um, we're doing what we can with these uh, websites and all of this information that Lori's put together so beautifully. And if I could just add to that, Lori and Teresa, this is Heather Stauffer from the Colorado Municipal League. I'm the legislative and policy advocate that worked on House Bill 1110 uh, last Yay. session. <laughs> we did make that argument um, that it was an unfunded mandate during the process of this bill. Um, and while we were not able to defeat the bill entirely, we did get some um, some amendments to the bill, which gave us the three-year implement implementation timeline. And then um, while it wasn't actually an amendment in the bill, we kind of had a handshake agreement with the state that they would help uh, local governments um, comply with this bill through the process. So Lori and Teresa have been an, a monumental help 
throughout this entire process um, in what they're doing. So we certainly appreciate it um, as, as we go along. But yeah, we did make that argument and um, here we are. <laughs> so happy to yeah. talk to anyone offline if they have more questions about that. I have my email in the chat. Thank you, Heather and Katie. You also um, commented that there are grants with SIPA to assist. Um, and, and we appreciate that this, this is a monumental task. And one of, the, one of the caveats I wanted to give about this planning is that, well, again, I can't say it enough, 100% accessibility is not, is, is not attainable. And um, if we can show that we're doing our due diligence, I believe that um, that will help us to keep working towards, you know, offering equitable services and addressing it as we can. You know, um, I think I hear the phrase undue burden frequently. Um, and really, we can only do what we can do. But I I do believe, like I said, that having a plan in place and being able to prove that you have made your best effort will have to be good enough. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> I'm a realist. So yeah, I'll be interested in hearing about those, you know, discussions moving forward because we absolutely, like Teresa said, we are advocating for, for you all too, as we have discussions about, you know, the direction that, and recommendations for, for future bills and future funding. One idea I had is um, for evaluations for your, your website is maybe go to your local college um, and check out their computer science departments. Most of them have somebody there who knows accessibility. Or sometimes there's even a class that has that's, that's all they work on for in this class is accessibility. Um, we have hired an ADA tester in, uh, at OIT and she used to work at DU and they have a whole group of people there that do accessibility. It's just it's just a thought. I haven't talked to them or anything, but it's something that, to think about. Debbie has a good question. Will there be an agency that determines if we are compliant or not in 2024, or will that just be determined if we get sued or not? Right. Yep. I mean, really, like, who determines if you're compliant or not? You, you will. Um, you're invited to determine that you know, in whatever way you can before you get sued. So, you know, um, understanding what your digital touch points are first and then prioritize them, um, you know, because your PDFs from 2003 might not be high on the list um, and then uh, addressing them as you can. Um, and then Eric says, I don't have it open in front of me, but I don't believe the bill gives any credit for best effort and sets up a bounty for getting payout for challenge, challenging any website that is anything less than 100% accessible. So, right, we have, um, it states any Colorado government entity that doesn't meet OIT's web accessibility standards could be subject to injunctive relief, meaning a court order to fix the problem actual monetary damages or a fine of $3,500 payable to the plaintiff who must be someone from the disability community. You're right, yeah, it's not, um, you don't, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna try to interpret it, but um, when a judge determines what the penalty is, um, I would make the assumption that that person is evaluating the case um, holistically. So being able to see that, you know, you all have done your best or, you know, your team has done your best to accommodate people may count for something, but I, we won't know 
until it goes and, and I And I would have to say, too, I mean, we've gone through some scenarios just, just to think about this. Let's say somebody doesn't have an alt tag um, of, of, an, of a balloon that's on the, the screen. Does that balloon really need to be, um, it's, does that help with the functionality of the task of what's really going to, you know, the person needs services? Do they really need to know that there's a balloon on the page? I mean, it should be alt tagged. Under WCAG standards, everything should be. But if it went to court, um, you know, is, how is that going to hold up? You know, I think a judge would go, you know what, you got your services, and um, that is a problem, and, and this will be fixed, but you did get your services. The task was completed. So these are the kind of scenarios we think about. We don't know how they're going to turn out. Like, you know, we're not lawyers, but to think about those sort of things keeps us on our toes. And Lucia asks, can we hire an accessibility expert instead of paying for manual testing? Or is manual testing required no matter what? Oh, that is a great question. Yes, having an accessibility um, subject matter expert on your team is ideal. And that person should be familiar with manual testing. So, um, yeah, I think that answers it. So yes, manual testing will help you to get the whole picture of whether you are compliant or not. And having an expert on your team who can continually be evaluating and remediating would be ideal. Yeah. Welcome. And Amy asks, can a government entity only be sued by a citizen in their jurisdiction or can anyone sue any government entity? Teresa, I think I remember it said anyone can sue from anywhere. Yes. It's anyone. It, oh, someone who's disabled using assistive technology disabled. in the state of Colorado. Oh, in the state of Colorado. So someone from Florida couldn't. Well, because they wouldn't be coming after us for services of any kind. Well, they might. I guess they might. I mean, they they have have moving to here. What's that? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, it sounds like we don't have a solid answer. We kind of remember <laughs> seeing something about that. I'm sorry. For sure, though, it's a disabled person using assistive technology. Right. Yeah. And Kim points out if they own a business, right, they could own a business out of state. Sure. They this could is Heather Stoffer again from CML. I would just encourage you all to put these legal questions to your municipal or county attorneys um, to have a, a more thorough answer. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, thanks. Right. Any other questions? We have four minutes left. And Katie shared um, the language of the bill. And Debbie, you are welcome. I'm glad, happy to help. I'm. I'm. Please feel free to um, reach out to. Um, Katie or Heather or McKenna with questions and requests and um, we hope that we can help to support you the best we can with the resources that we have. I totally understand this is a huge challenge. Um, it's, it's a wicked problem. It's um, yeah and uh, we're just offering everything that we have for you all and hope that wish you all well. We'll probably talk again, hopefully in the near future. So um, just before we wrap up, as we stated earlier, this will be recorded and put online so everyone will have access to it afterward. You will get a link to all of this information next week um, and that will contain the forms as well as the presentation and the video. Um, and then I'll send that email out. So please feel free to respond to 
McKenna Sturgeon um, from Colorado Municipal League with any follow-up questions. And I can put you in touch with um, whoever can answer those. We're happy to be a resource. So again, please take advantage of us as much as you can. Um, we're here to help. So Lori, Teresa, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for being here and giving us this great information. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lori. Day off on Monday. Have a good one.